Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to announce the arrival of the guest of honor, Mr. Ong Yi Kang, Minister for Education, Higher Education and Skills, and Second Minister for Defense, Republic of Singapore. Good morning, Minister Ong Yee Kang, Ambassador Gopinath Pillai, Mr. Amitabh Kant, Minister Sayed Raza Ali Gilani, Professor Tan Eng Chai, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ankush and I have the pleasure of being your MC today. On behalf of the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore, I welcome you to the 12th ISAS International Conference on South Asia, titled Emerging South Asia, politics, economy, and international relations. To start the proceedings, I would like to invite Ambassador Gopinath Pillai, Chairman, Institute of South Asian Studies, NUS, and Ambassador at Large, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Singapore, to deliver the welcome remarks. Ambassador, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this conference. Mr. Ong Hee Kang, Minister for Education and Second Minister for Defense. Mr. Jilani, Minister for Higher Education, Punjab, Pakistan. Mr. Amitabh Khan, Chief Executive Officer, National Institution for Transforming India. Professor Tan Eng Chai, President of NUS distinguished diplomats, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Institute of South Asian Studies, I welcome you all to this 12th ISAS International Conference. We are actually 15 years old, but we started the conference series a couple of years after we were in business. From the list of our main speakers. You have Minister for Higher Education for Singapore. We have Minister for Higher Education Punjab. We have the President of the one of the top universities of Singapore of the world, NUS. We have the the Institute of Niti Aayog's CEO. This this conference should have been on education. So, but do not think that we got it wrong. I think what we are saying is education is the, the Banco's goes, is, go, is there all the time. All the uh, effort that we do for, the, for politics, for economy, for geopolitics, and so on. The underlying thing is always education. So we have not wrong in getting a very high distinguished panel of speakers who have got an education background. I, I, I'm not trying to stretch it a bit to justify it, but there was some method in our madness. South Asia, Asia today is one of the fastest growing regions in the world. We at ISAS have therefore focused our attention on the phenomena of emergence as the theme for this year's conference. There have been important developments in South Asia in the areas of areas that we are focusing on, that is politics, economy, and international relations. Let me start with politics. I think one of the most political regions of the world is South Asia. Almost every country has got a degree of democracy. They have institutions that are fairly well entrenched in politics and 
a population that is very involved, very political in their nature. When I mention institutions, one institution that I like to specially mention is the Election Commission of India. I think it is one of the most impressive institutions in the whole wide world in this field. It's no joke to get what uh, seven seven hundred million people voters. Population is about one point three. Out of that, I think about seven six seven hundred million are voters to get them. And when you see much more developed countries messing around with vote counting and uh, somewhat uh, backward or developing country like India is able to do it so effectively, so efficiently, so credibly, that's very impressive. That is one of the things of South Asia that you can be proud of. In the economic uh, realm, international organizations such as World Bank have forecast robust growth rate for in the near future for almost all of South Asia. India, the largest member of the region, has focused on attracting foreign investment by liberalizing key sectors such as defense, infrastructure, railway, and insurance, among others. The, government's, uh, the government has carried off several economic reforms which has attracted foreign investment. Pakistan has benefited from increased investments, particularly from China, uh, while Bangladesh is today a leading manufacturer of textile products. Sri Lanka has in, in, in initiated policy of reforms to stimulate growth in the services sector. Bhutan has embarked on building three major hydropower projects to boost the industries and for revenue. Of course, more can be done and needs to be done. However, we must bear in mind that each of these countries is continuously ma managing the compulsions of politics and economic needs. In terms of geopolitics and international relations, countries of South Asia are active participants in strategic discussions, be it Indo-Pacific, the Quad, the Road and Belt and Road, and the Corridor, Asia-Africa Corridor. There are possibilities of many of these becoming very active and contributors to the economy. While we are in, we see progress in the countries of South Asia, the region still faces enormous constraints which impede both intra-regional and inter-regional cooperation and collaboration. In my view, one of the greatest constraints facing South Asia is the lack of regional integration. The World Bank reports that South Asia is one of the least integrated regions in the world. Intra-regional trade accounts for only 5% of South Asia's total trade compared to 25% in Asia. Intra-regional investment is less than 1% of South Asia's overall investment. I remember that uh, many years ago when I was High Commissioner to Pakistan, uh, I was, you know, Singapore has a system where you, you can have a private sector incarnation and a public sector profile as well. So I was in logistics in India and the Pakistani friends of mine said, look at this in Pakistan. I said, I could do it, but my senior management are mainly from India. They said, that would be difficult. It has to be from Singapore. And Singapore, you know, with our constraints, it's not that easy to get people to travel. So finally, we didn't do very much uh, on that because of this sort of constraints. So I think this is a, a major problem. One needs to, if you want regional integration, you need to forget some of the past. You need to forget that 
little irritations will happen all the time, especially in a family. You know, they speak the same language, the same culture and sort of thing is bound to happen. But leadership must rise above this to be able to assert itself and say what is good for the people is when you integrate. I would like to, finally, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all the main speakers, the panelists and so on. A special thanks to the minister, our guest of honor, Mr. Hong Yi Kang. He has just come back from a very tiring journey to Russia and I'm very, very grateful to him for being here. He was our guest about a month ago and he has come back. He has been one of our most ardent supporters and I am very grateful to him. Thank you, Mr. Hong. I want to thank the Minister uh, for Higher Education from Punjab, Mr. Jilani, for coming. We haven't had a uh, Pakistani minister for quite some time, not for want of trying, but there have been, you know, major preoccupations and therefore. One of my dreams has been to have a dialogue in, organized by ISAS in Singapore of the two Punjabs, Punjab in Pakistan and Punjab in India. Many years ago, I had uh, dinner with the, with Mr. Shabazz uh, uh, when he was, uh, Shabazz Sharif was, at that time I think was not uh, the Chief Minister. And we talked about it and he was quite sympathetic but it could not be done. But I'm sure during my lifetime I will see it done. So I'm hoping for it because it's one of the great things that one could do for regional integration. Then I want to thank Mr. Abhitabh Khan. Since I'm chairing the session where he's speaking, I will say what I want to do to say during that uh, speech. Then, of course, I must thank Professor Taneng Chai, the provost. Uh, sorry, the pro he was the provost and he is now president of the university. He just told me that he had completed his 100 days. So yeah, he doesn't have to face the same trials as Mr. Trump because he has got a much better record. But what I wanted to say was when Professor Tan was appointed president, one of the things I told him was his first public speech should be at ISAS. I think I may have succeeded in getting that done. I'm not sure, He's, he can correct me later. But uh, I'm very grateful to him. He's a, a great president and a great supporter of ISAS. ISAS has grown tremendously because of the stakeholders who support us. The University, National University of Singapore, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Trade and Industry. Then, of course, the large number of, of scholars we get from the region who give their, of their best. And uh, ISAS is the beneficiary of all that. So I want to thank them. And of course, I want to thank you all for coming on a working day in the morning and being here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Pillai. Ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to invite Professor Tan Eng Chai, President, National University of Singapore, to deliver the opening address. Professor Tan, please. Good morning. Uh, no, this is not my first public speech. <laughs> and I think I made the mistake. Not yet 100 days. <laughs> Few more days to go to hit my 100 days. Good morning, Mr. Ong Yi Kang, Minister for Education, Higher Education and Skills, and Second Minister for Defense, Ambassador Gopinan Pillay, Ambassador at Large, and Chairman, Institute for South Asian Studies, Mr. Amita Khan. Chief Executive Officer, National Institution for Transforming India, Mr. Said Raza Ali Galani, Minister for Higher Education, Punjab, Pakistan, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen. I'm very happy to join you on this occasion of the ISES 12th International Conference on South Asia. South Asia 
is one of the most dynamic regions in the world today. South Asian countries, bound by historical, religious, and cultural ties, present a rich and diverse landscape for international relations and academic and research collaborations. This conference is a good opportunity for me to reflect and present on our university's ties and dealings in South Asia. From a Singapore perspective, South Asia's proximity to our shores has naturally led to long-standing and multifaceted relations between us. Singapore is home to a significant South Asian diaspora, comprising businessmen, professorates, students, and workers. As a microcosm of the world, NUS staff and students come from across the world, and a significant number are from South Asia. Over the years, economic and political ties between Singapore and South Asia have deepened, as have people-to-people -people exchanges. NUS has had the privilege of hosting eminent personalities from South Asian countries and their respective diasporas for public engagements in Singapore. For instance, in 2017, Mr. Muhammad Ashraf Ghani, Afghanistan's president, addressed the NUS Society Dialogue. More recently, the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy hosted Mr. Rahul Gandhi, president of the Indian National Congress, for a public lecture. Through such engagements, our students gain direct insights from leaders in South Asia. NUS serves as a bridge between South Asia, Singapore, and the Southeast Asia region at large through our many programs, academic work, and research. Nearly two decades ago, NUS established the South Asian Studies Program at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, offering bachelor's, master's, and doctorate qualifications. The South Asian Studies Program, which is the only such program in the ASEAN region, has attracted students from several different nationalities. Several of our research institutes have been deeply involved in South Asia. The NUS Institute of South Asian Studies was established in 2004 as a research institute housed at NUS dedicated to research on contemporary South Asia and to communicate knowledge and insights about the region to policy makers, the business community, academia, and civil society. The Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy has also been actively involved in South Asia. The school's Center on Asia and Globalization has held six China-India Security Roundtables since 2011. The Asia Competitiveness Institute, a think tank at the school, has produced publications which were submitted to India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi, as well as the Chief Ministers of the States of Andhra Pradesh, Bihar, Chhattisgarh, Maya Pradesh, Odisha, and Punjab. NUS enjoys a strong reputation in South Asia, and we are a university of choice for many South Asian students. To give a sense of the numbers, NUS has nearly 5,000 alumni from India alone. And we have an active alumni chapter in New Delhi that was formed in 2003, organizing events and reunions for alumni in the region. South Asian alumni of NUS have gone on to work in many distinct professions across the public and private sectors. As of this year, the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, a graduate school of NUS, training leaders in government and public policy, 
has graduated nearly 200 alumni from South Asia who are currently working in the government. Since 2005, the school's executive education arm has trained 3,000 leaders from South Asia in its short-term and executive courses, mostly from India and Sri Lanka, but also from Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan, and Bhutan, amongst others. Five of the 18 official chapters of the Lee Kuan Yew School are in South Asian countries, namely India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Bhutan. The Singapore E-Government Leadership Center at the NUS Institute of System Science is also actively involved in providing executive leadership capacity building programs for public service officers in South Asia. For example, in March 2018, an MOU was signed between this institute and the Bangladesh government's ICT division to deliver capacity building programs and undertake applied research in digital government in support of Digital Bangladesh 2021. Beyond bringing South Asian students to NUS, NUS also brings our students to South Asia. NUS offers many opportunities for semester-long student immersions and exchanges with various South Asian universities. Some of these institutions include IIT Bombay, the Indian School of New Business, and the University of Delhi, Lady Sri Lam College for Women, amongst others. Additionally, NUS students have also have opportunities to experience South Asia firsthand through shorter-term programs such as the study trips for engagement and enrichment. One such trip of 25 student delegates traveled to Sri Lanka in 2014. The theme of the trip was reimagining Sri Lanka, social entrepreneurship and post-Civil War reconstruction. The delegation visited the University of Colombo and non-government organizations across 10 cities in Sri Lanka. NUS has organized 10 such trips, bringing hundreds of students to India and many of the South Asian countries. Beyond the classroom, NUS also offers many experiential and practical learning opportunities in South Asia. Since 2014, the Center for Future Ready Graduates has organized internships for students to intern in India with established Indian companies such as Infosys, the Tata Group, and Hindustan Unilever, as well as with many educational institutions and civil society groups. All these activities and opportunities for exchanges that I've highlighted above have brought about rich multifaceted interactions and promote ties between the youths of Singapore and of South Asia. South Asia is an important region and NUS is actively involved in the region, whether it be in education, social, people or research networks. NUS brings South Asia to Singapore and we bring Singapore to South Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to conclude by reiterating that as one of Asia's foremost universities, NUS seeks to create linkages and to promote interactions and knowledge sharing between Singapore and South Asia, to build networks for collaboration and growth. On this note, I wish all the speakers and participants a very fruitful and enjoyable conference. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tan. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to now invite 
Mr. Ong Yee Kong, Minister for Education, Higher Education and Skills, and Second Minister for Defense, to deliver the keynote address for the conference. Minister, please. Ambassador Gopinath Bide, Chairman of ISAS, Mr. Jilani, Minister for Higher Education of the State of Punjab, Pakistan, Mr. Amitabh Khan, CEO, National Institution for Transforming India, Mr. Syed Raza, oh sorry, I already mentioned you, <laughs> Professor Taning Chai, the President of NUS, congratulations for approaching your 100 days. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for inviting me to the opening of this 12th ISAS International Conference on South Asia. I just came back this morning uh, from the 7th Moscow Conference on International Security. So from Russia to South Asia, from security issues to now, I'm going to talk mostly, mostly about economic issues. So the contrast is quite big, but such is the interesting thing about Singapore. We try to play a role in as many regions as we can across different domains. To talk about South Asia is, I realized as I was preparing this speech, is very challenging because it's such a vast and diverse region. It's like trying to tell you about Singapore food in 15 minutes. It's quite impossible. But Ambassador Gopina Pile has given you just now a useful overview of the key developments in South Asia, but let me add a few more points. We all agree that South Asia has emerged as an important region of growth and things are looking up for the region. Bangladesh, let me start with Bangladesh, is expected to be one of the fastest growing developing countries in the next few years. Prime Minister, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina just visited Singapore last month at the invitation of PM Lee Hsien Loong. Singapore's bilateral trade with Bangladesh has grown almost 30% over the last five years, from 3.4 billion to 4.3 billion. We have recently updated our agreement on air services and our companies are exploring investment opportunities in Bangladesh. Sri Lanka is another promising story. With the end of a civil conflict, she has embarked on a transition from a predominantly rural-based economy to one that is more competitive, inclusive and resilient. New major developmental projects are underway, not only in Colombo, but also cities like Kandy, Trincomalee, and Hambantota. Many Singaporean Indians trace their roots back to Sri Lanka, and we share a precious cultural linkage. Earlier this year, Prime Minister Lee visited Sri Lanka and witnessed the signing of a bilateral free trade agreement between our two countries. And I think this will this promises to bring our economic cooperation to a new level. Growth in Pakistan is expected to enjoy an uptick in the next couple of years. Like other South Asian countries, Pakistan is seeking to improve its infrastructure through initiatives such as the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. It has important advantages, including a young, rapidly urbanizing population and is a strategic outlet to the Arabian Sea for many landlocked Central Asian countries. The largest South Asian country is India. Its economic growth surged to 7.2% year on year in the final quarter of 2017, making her the world's fastest growing major economy. This momentum is likely to continue and there's vast potential to be tapped. Our economic relationship with India is healthy and growing. We signed an FTA with India many years ago, which is now also part of the negotiations of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, or RCEP, together with ASEAN, China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. Singapore is watching the significant developments in India closely. India has undertaken a number of reforms and national initiatives in recent years which have contributed to its remarkable growth and its transformation. These include, first, the passing of the GST legislation, the biggest tax reform India has ever undertaken. And so, finally, India is one single market. 
implementation of ATHA, the world's largest digital and biometric identification program, and this is a huge step for financial inclusion in India. The monetization of 500 rupee and 1,000 rupee currency notes to weed out black money and counterfeit notes. And this has the other effect of boosting digital payments in India. And a slew of government initiatives such as Make in India, Skills India, Startup India, aimed at facilitating job creation and inclusive growth. Second. India, by 2050, based on the Price Waterhouse Coopers report, is likely to be one of the two largest economies in the world, between China and India, surpassing the United States. Both have pursued different models to drive growth, China and India. China, being more centrally governed, has promoted investments, exports, and economic restructuring through systemic and nationwide economic plans. India, a federated democracy, is far more laissez-faire when it comes to economic strategy. It also focuses more on services. But there is no doubt that the rise of China and India is shifting the center of gravity of the global world economy, global economy eastwards towards Asia. This is a major geop geopolitical shift that will change the world. It will also have significant implications for Southeast Asia and Singapore. Now that I give a very broad whirlwind tour of South Asia, let me now talk about a different part of the world, which is Finland. I assure you it is relevant to the topic that we are talking about and relevant to this conference. I was in Finland a few months ago, and I visited the International Chamber of Commerce in Helsinki. I was briefed on how the melting of the polar ice caps is opening up a new trade route across the, across the Arctic. The Arctic route shortens the distance between Northern Europe, around Scandinavia region, and Northeast Asia, where Japan, Korea, and Northern part of China is. My briefing was accompanied by a video, and you can see this actually on YouTube. It, depict, it depicted a race between two container ships. Both ships are starting from Japan. One, the first ship, will take the Arctic route to reach Scandinavia. The other will take the traditional uh, maritime silk route down South China Sea, Straits of Malacca, Indian Ocean, Suez Canal, and then around continental Europe, around Mediterranean Sea to Scandinavia. So both ships, a very dramatic video with, with orchestra music. Both container ships start at the same time. So the first container ship that took the Arctic route arrived at its destination only when the second ship have just reached the Gulf of Aden. Still some way to go. So the Arctic route is now accessible only in summer months from May to November. And my host actually quite welcomed climate change. He felt that as ice caps melt, at some point the Arctic route can be saleable all year round. And by then, maybe it will be one belt, one road, and one circle. So question really, he is all very bullish about it, but of course, for us living in Southeast Asia, we start asking ourselves, will this undermine Singapore's position as a maritime hub? Is it time to feel worried? Well, this narrative forgets one important fact that undergirds Singapore's maritime status, which is that we have always been the node of many trade routes since 700 years ago. In particular, we serve the China-India trade. And today, that has expanded to be the East Asia-South Asia trade. That is not replaceable. That's not replaceable by an Arctic route. Because the Arctic doesn't lead to South Asia. So whether it's not replaceable, whether by overland belt across continental Asia and Europe, or the Arctic route. So long as international trade continues to grow and the world stays integrated, we will need all routes to serve the growing movement of people and goods. 
Further, building upon our maritime status, Singapore was able to develop its logistics, manufacturing and financial services over time, serving all our economic partners around the world. Our vitality as an economy no longer just rests on being a maritime hub. Various services and industries come together layer upon layer to make us a global commercial hub. I therefore look at the future with much more optimism. So long as India and China, East Asia and South Asia remain stable and continue to grow, the entire thoroughfare of Southeast Asia, including Singapore, will stand to benefit. But we need to work hard, be of service to others, be innovative, add value wherever we can. So for the rest of today's speech, let me outline four golden opportunities where Singapore can add value to South Asian countries. They are not exhaustive, but I think nevertheless, golden opportunities that should not be missed and should perhaps and should involve some rethinking of the way we do things now. These opportunities relate to certain expertise that Singapore has developed and which is, I think, relevant to South Asian countries. They are first, infrastructure development, second, bridging skills development gap, third, cooperation in technology, innovation and entrepreneurship, and fourth, collaboration in building of smart cities. So first, infrastructure development. This is one of the most urgent tasks in South Asia. Public investment in energy, transport, healthcare, education can lead to tangible improvements in people's lives and provide the foundation for further economic growth. The Belt and Road Initiative led by China promises to boost infrastructure development throughout Asia. Singapore can be an effective enabler for infrastructure investments. Today, 33% of all outward investments from China related to Belt and Road flows through Singapore, while 85% of inbound investments from Belt and Road countries into China for the initiative comes through Singapore. And we can play a similar role for South Asia. We are serving this need in a way disproportionate to our size because of our deep capital markets and financial ecosystem. The capital required for infrastructure development far exceeds what the domestic banking sectors of the investment recipient countries can provide. And Singapore offers further options in global infrastructure financing. A number of South Asian companies are already raising funds in Singapore through bond listings, tapping on long-term institutional funds. Singapore companies have also made inroads into South Asia's infrastructure market. SEMCORP, for example, is one of the largest investors in the energy sector in Bangladesh, with over US 1.1 billion invested in power plants. PSA is exploring opportunities in the Chittagong port. Singapore companies have also embarked on tourism and commercial development projects in Sri Lanka. Other projects are being planned across the region. To forge stronger partnership in infrastructure development and help more companies tap infrastructure opportunities in Asia, including South Asia, we will be setting up an infrastructure office this year. And I think Financial Finance Minister Hing Sui Kit announced this yesterday. The office will bring together local and international firms across the value chain, from developers, institutional investors, to legal, accounting and financial services providers to develop, finance, and execute the projects. Second, skills development, which is my pet topic. South Asia as a whole is endowed with a large and young workforce with a huge demographic dividend, and is against the backdrop of growth and development. And so there's a great demand for skills training. Having a skilled and educated population does not just contribute to economic growth. It creates positive, social political outcomes. Singapore plays a modest but active role in working with South Asian countries to bridge the skills development gap. For example, Nanyang Polytechnic International is involved in a World Bank project to support Bangladesh to train about 1,200 leaders and specialists from polytechnics and vocational institutions. ITE in Education Services is working with the Bangladesh Ministry of Finance to strengthen the pedagogical competencies of 80 technical and vocational trainers. We hope these efforts will help support growth in Bangladesh's priority sectors. 
We also have similar projects in Sri Lanka. Last year, Tamasic Polytechnic conducted a course in digital and social media marketing for government agencies. ITE Education Services also conducted a leadership development program aimed at enhancing the skills of 60 teachers in the vocational and technical education sector. And these 60 leaders in turn transfer their knowledge to another 290 leaders. And that's the cascading effect that we want to see. As for India, she's the world's second most populous nation, but faces significant challenges in delivering education to her population, especially for those in the rural areas. The Indian government has set up a priority to raise literacy rates and equip its youth with the right skills. As a start, India established the Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship in 2014 to coordinate all skills development efforts in the country. In 2015, Skills India was launched to drive industry-relevant training to Indian youths. The Indian government has also implemented a national skills qualifications framework to develop a common currency in informal and formal skills recognition throughout the country. When Prime Minister Modi visited Singapore in 2015, I was his minister in attendance, and he toured the ITE College Central. He asked if Singapore could help set up more training centres in India, and we responded. Today, Singapore has helped set up the World Class Skills Centre in New Delhi, and the Centre of Excellence for Tourism Training in Udaipur, Rajasthan. Several other projects are underway, including a third skill centre in Assam to train workers in beauty, retail, hospitality and F&B services. Prime Minister Modi is visiting Singapore again in June. It would be a good opportunity for both sides to take stock of the progress that we have made in different pillars of our strategic partnership and explore areas for further cooperation. Singapore students also have much to learn from India. Ongoing student exchange programs and learning visits, um, Professor Tan Ning Chai spoke to the, about it just now, they open up our students' minds to the rich history and culture of South Asia. For example, student leaders from the Singapore National Cadet Corps take part in the desert trekking program in India every year. A most memorable experience, I'm sure. I don't know how long they track, probably a few days. Could have been weeks. Research collaborations too is ongoing. They bring our education institutions and organizations together to prod the knowledge frontier. Third, we can collaborate to develop our technology and innovation ecosystem. Technology is changing the way we work, how services are delivered and consumed, and India has embraced this wave of change. Prime Minister Modi's Jandan Yojana program. I, I wasn't too sure how to pronounce this in Hindi, so I checked with Mr. Gopinath Pillay. Jandan Yojana, I pronounced correctly. <laughs> it's providing universal access to basic banking services for India's population of over 1 billion people. India also implemented ADHA, its national digital identification system, and then India stack a set of APIs that is built around ADHA would allow government agencies and private companies to deploy paperless and cashless services. As I mentioned earlier, India's fintech ambitions also receive a boost from the demonetization of certain currency notes, which has accelerated the digitization of financial services in India. So in India, we found a kindred spirit in fintech because that is also a key activity in Singapore. India has a vast market, and in Singapore, we have almost every global financial institution operating here, and they are interested to invest in and serve the Indian market. So there's clear synergy between us. To date, Singapore has signed agreements with the governments of Andhra Pradesh and Maharashtra to bolster cooperation in promoting fintech innovation in our respective markets. India and Singapore are also working closely to establish cross-border digital payment linkages. NETS is working with the National Payment Corporation of India, or NPCI, to enable cross-border usage of their payment solutions in India and Singapore. One such collaboration will allow NETS payments at all 2.8 million rupee point-of-sale terminals in India, 
and vice versa, rupee cards will be acceptable, accepted for payment at Nets Terminal in Singapore. Imagine if one day this collaboration expands to cover the whole of South Asia and Southeast Asia. The psychological impact of our closeness will be very significant. DBS Bank established India's first digit bank in 2016. This is a Singapore bank which decided to incubate an innovative project not in Singapore but in India. And it's a wise and natural choice because the demand is in India. The Digit Bank has no physical branches and customer authentication is done via Adha to provide a paperless and signatureless banking experience to customers. So in less than two years, more than 1.5 million customers have signed up for DBS Digibank and the customer base is expected to expand to 5 million by 2021. The final golden opportunity for collaboration is in urban planning and the building of smart cities. Urbanization is gathering pace throughout the continent, which presents a dilemma. The migration of rural to urban workforce raises productivity, but at the same time places tremendous stress on urban infrastructure and facilities. I talked about infrastructure development earlier, but beyond hardware, the software matters too, and this is where smart cities come in. Singapore has developed useful experience in urban planning and sustainable development. We are constantly planning ahead for the long term, and because of our small size, we optimize land use wherever we can. Over the decades, we also acquired know-how in managing and operating infrastructural systems, such as water, energy, airport, seaport, land transport, telecommunications, waste management, not just individually, but as a coordinated whole to keep our city humming away, functioning efficiently and effectively. All this come together as a smart ecosystem. As ASEAN Chair this year, Singapore has made the building of smart cities network in our region a key priority. Through this platform, cities across ASEAN can work with the private sector and external partners such as India towards the common goal of smart and sustainable urban development. An example of a smart city is the new capital city of Andhra Pradesh, Amaravati, for which Singapore is honoured to be a developmental partner. The vision is for Amaravati to be a livable and sustainable city, which will include an innovation corridor where companies will pilot their urban solutions together. We have also embarked on several urban planning projects with Sri Lanka. Sabana Jurong has been playing an active role in master planning major development projects such as the Megapolis in the Western Province and in Trincomalee. We are also collaborating with Sri Lanka to help clean up the Bera Lake and redevelop the surrounding areas, making it attractive to locals, tourists, and potential investors. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude. So much has changed over the last century. The nation state was born. It brought stability to the world order. And today we think in terms of bilateral and multilateral cooperation. And we strive to reduce cross-border imped impediments to trade and investments. At the same time, technology has, have been, has been advancing at a breakneck pace and exponentially. And with digital connectivity, the world has shrunk. While opportunities abound, at the same time, we see so much strife, extremism, nationalism, xenophobia, discrimination, degradation, that reminds us that the human race, we still have a lot to improve on. However, the video I saw in Finland about the melting of ice caps reminded me that some things do not change. And that is the centuries-old logic that if the civilizations of East Asia and South Asia are prospering and at peace with each other, there will be a constant and free flow of goods, investment, people, ideas, knowledge, and digitized codes. In the past, traders have to wait a whole year for the monsoon winds to change direction in order to trade and carry goods and services across the continents. Today, this happened 365 days a year, 24-7. We are only constrained 
by our willingness to be able to resolve differences and work together. The growth of East and South Asia can bring about an era of unprecedented progress and growth in both our regions and Southeast Asia. I wish you a fruitful and successful conference. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. We will now have a question and answer session with the Minister. To chair the session, I would like to invite back on stage Ambassador Gopinath Pillai. I now hand over the floor to Ambassador Pillai. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the um, Minister has given a very comprehensive speech. He has agreed to take some questions. He has got a limitation in time. He has only about 15 or 16 minutes. So make your and, question. And I'm severely jet lagged too. <laughs> <laughs> so be kind to him. Don't ask too difficult questions. But uh, he is up to it, even though he may be jet lagged. I suggest that you don't make long speeches. Please ask the question. Give your name, ask the question, and I'll take a few questions at a time because the limitations of time. Yeah. Yes, this gentleman here. Yeah. Very good morning and assalamu alaikum, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Zubair. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Lahore Knowledge Park and endeavor to bring in the knowledge economy in Pakistan. My question to the minister is 90% of your speech was Singapore India relations. And you are talking on an occasion on ISAS. Any mention of other countries or your endeavors like Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Maldives, Bhutan, Nepal? Thank you. And I'm too kind being you are jet lagged. Okay, one more question. Yes. Joshua. Thank you all. This is Joshua. Um, Minister Ong, you talk about quite extensively Southeast Asia and talk about Scandinavian countries, etc. Also notice last midnight, uh, despite of your jet lag, in your Facebook you also mentioned about the, the trade war and the, the deglobalization, I mean, in the different lingos. Could you please share with us uh, what is your perspective on this morning announcement by UIS? Because this is one of the conference politics and economy. Um, $100 billion will be imposed on China, etc. So how do you feel and what is going to happen to Southeast Asia? This is number one. Number two is, you know, we are all very passionate about um, the skills. We've got an opportunity to work together with you on CFE. So do you have any game plans actually on skills and professional development for the whole Southeast Asia rather than Singapore and India and Singapore and other friendly countries? So that will be very helpful for Singaporeans to have opportunity to pursue international or regional internship opportunities and job opportunities that will really will mold Singaporeans for future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, one more question here. Gurdeep Singh. Uh, uh, <coughs> Good morning, Mr. Gurdeep Singh from Press Trust of India. Just a follow on to this net rupee arrangement being worked out. Uh, do we see this happening sometime this year or do we have a time frame on that? Thank you. Okay, I think we Maybe I start with the third one, Nets and Rupay. I'm afraid I don't have the details with me. Uh, I, I will certainly be happy to check with the MAS staff that I work with, but I, I think both sides are approaching this with a great sense of urgency because of the great potential that this will bring about. On, on the other issue about the coverage of my speech, maybe my math is a bit off. Huh? but I don't think it's 90%, 10% split. I, I thought specifically on infrastructure development, there's great opportunities in Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, and our Prime Minister have received Bangladesh's uh, leader recently and also visited Sri Lanka and signed an FTA. And so these are all huge areas. And on education as well, we have also been working with many countries in South Asia and not just India, yeah. Um, of course, in certain areas, I think India, because of the various reform uh, steps that they had taken, I think I ought to mention them in my speech specifically. GST, Skills India, uh, Amaravati, these are major projects that I think is fair for me to mention in my speech as well. 
All in all, I think Singapore being a small country, we can't pick and choose partners. We want to work with as many people as our resources and our wits can take us. Which leads me to the question that Joshua asked um, about skills and professional development. You are referring to skills and professional development of Singapore uh, talent, making use of global opportunities. This is something that I'm very keen to do for our higher education system. Because these days, education is no longer about just attending lectures. In fact, young people don't just want to go to university or polytechnic to attend lectures. You can get the best lectures online. You know? I don't have to go to university. Uh, so university offers an experience. And one of the main experience is the ability to learn about other cultures, work in the different cultures, learn some setbacks and learn how to bounce back and be resilient. And I think NUS and Professor Tan Ning Chai is a champion in creating an NUS experience, not just NUS lectures. And I think all our universities are very mindful of that. So wherever we can, we will want our students within that three, four years of their education experience in university, have a stint overseas. And that, I think, will help them uh, a lot throughout their lifetime. Joshua also asked about trade and what I think about US-China. Um, we, we have come a long way. To open up trade in the past, there were wars. Today, at least we've gone past that as a civilization. We have trade rules, we have nation states engaged in trade rules and trade negotiations. So you don't have to go to war in order to open up trade. That painful history is in the past. But today, you can still have trade war, although not a military war. But certainly, we would prefer that countries with their legitimate concern sit down and negotiate which I think is ultimately what the United States and what China wanted to. How to get there, I think they are now in a state where each one is upping uh, tariff uh, and ta imposing tariff on the others. And I hope that all this will in time come to the negotiation table. Both sides will bring forward their legitimate concerns and they will they be able to sort out a deal. Otherwise, this is uh, highly damaging to the entire global uh, trading system. In Southeast Asia and Singapore, being trading nations, will bound to be affected. So fingers crossed. I think we will always be on the side of talking and not going to trade war. Thank you, Minister. You ended your speech, I'm Jivanta Shetley from the Institute of South Asian Studies. You ended your speech with the call that we have to focus on the willingness to work together. This is an often asked question, but I'd like to hear your view. What has been ASEAN's um, secret to the success of working together? Next question. Anybody? No? Okay, while you think of what? Yeah. ASEAN's secret. Our secret is the fact that uh, geography is our destiny. And geography has situated ASEAN across, straddling across the major trade routes of history and past, present, and future. And because of that, ASEAN naturally understands that we need trade to survive. We need trade to do well. We need China. India and today in a globalized world, the United States, Europe, to all have good positive relationship with each other, cooperating, and when trade flows, it flows through ASEAN, and that gives us a living. So ASEAN coming together as a international, uh, regional institution was, to some people, they describe it as an Asian miracle. Since our formation, 1967, if I remember correctly, we've never gone to war. It's always been at peace, and I think that is grounded by our sense of our geography, our purpose in the world economic system, and despite the fact that ASEAN has a breathtaking diversity of different religions all located within these 10 countries, we coexisted peacefully together because we know that world's trade flows through 
Southeast Asia. Yeah. That, I think, is our secret. And today, because of that outlook, uh, ASEAN has become non-threatening, neutral and objective platform for major powers to engage in our region. That's why we are able to have forums such as ARF. Uh, in, my, in my position as Second Minister for Defence, we are also very active in ADMM, ASEAN Defence Ministers Meeting, and ADMM Plus, which included eight global powers, including uh, Russia, US, China, India. Uh, and also, we were very instrumental in the formation of APEC, in the formation of East Asian Summit, which is also all of which are open and inclusive regional architecture for ASEAN to be a central ground for global powers to engage each other. And that is really our most valuable world in the global system today. Thank you, Minister, for the keynote address. Uh, my name is Jia Hao from the Institute of South Asian Studies. Uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, several of the smaller South Asian countries, for instance, uh, Bhutan, Sri Lanka and Maldives, look to Singapore, especially in terms of Singapore's governance, uh, peace and prosperity. Uh, what advice would the Minister have for these countries? Thank you. Just one more question. Thank you, sir. I'm from the ASEAN Study Centre, and I should like to add that the secret of ASEAN is that our largest member, Indonesia, can accept equality in ASEAN. And ASEAN region is nuclear weapon free zone. So that's our secret. My question to Minister is, the newspaper said when you were in Moscow, you also met your defense counterpart from China, Russia, and India. I should like to ask you, uh, do you discuss in the Moscow conference the new free and open Indo-Pacific concept? And if you did, may I ask your impression of the discussion and how this new Indo-Pacific concept is going to affect or change the strategic situation in South Asia and even in Southeast Asia. Thank you, sir. Thank you. One more. This one. Was there one more? I thought I okay. Okay. First question. I think um, Singapore, after 52 years, we managed to improve the lives of our people. We developed our city. But I don't think we are in a position to give advice to other countries. Every country has their own challenges, their own circumstances. The people have their own hopes and dreams. But I think we are more than happy to always uh, exchange views and learn from each other. When we first started uh, with our founding, founding generation of leaders, uh, we, we took a very practical approach that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Whatever problems we have, uh, others have solved it before. And so we went out to learn from others, learn from every country that has encountered the same problem and try to adapt it to our local circumstances. And that has to be, continue to be our approach. There's still many challenges, uh, and I'm sure we can learn from many different countries, uh, including from South Asia. And if everybody approached with the, approached their challenges with the same uh, attitude, then I think there's much to learn from each other. On the issue of Indo-Pacific, free and open Indo-Pacific uh, initiative, I think you are referring to the initiative raised by the US some time ago. Uh, it wasn't a focal topic in the Moscow conference, but I would say this. Uh, in the initial years when, when APEC was set up, it was a deliberate decision to set up APEC as an open and inclusive regional infrastructure that engages countries across the Pacific Ocean. And that idea that Pacific Ocean is no longer a barrier but a bridge between two sides of the continents. So you think about the APEC structure, uh, there's a lot of wisdom involved with US, Chile, Mexico, Canada, all engaged, and Peru, engaged in East Asia, including Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia. And when we first set up East Asia Summit, I remember that was an idea uh, raised by Dr. Mahathir yeah, at that time. Uh, again, Singapore was instrumental in working 
with other like-minded countries to ensure that although it's called East Asia Summit, it is actually an inclusive architecture involving India and New Zealand and Australia, other than, strictly speaking, the East Asian countries located in the East Asian geography. So always we want to think about a regional architecture that crosses ocean, that engages countries across the oceans. So likewise, if there's an idea about Indo-Pacific, uh, any form of Indo-Pacific regional forum, it has to be in that form so that we engage countries across the region and make sure that Southeast Asia is always open and inclusive. That has to be always our mindset. We have time for one more question and I want to ask Minister's permission to ask that question. Certainly, you are, you are the chairman of ISIS. <laughs> Minister, you said something very true that the brand name of Singapore is very high in all the South Asian countries. But yet, when you look at investments by Singaporeans in South Asia as a whole, it's still very negligible. I suspect that Singaporeans, as they grew wealthier and more successful, they have become more risk averse. And therefore, they look for very, very safe investments. And what may appear safe uh, are not that many in South Asia. And they do not want to venture. In the old days, uh, if you, I mean, I must go back according to my age, you know. Uh, say 30 years ago, 40 years ago, Singaporeans were everywhere in Southeast Asia. They learned Thai language, they learned the Vietnamese language. They were there trying to get a piece of the cake. But now, no, they stay at home and try to do their best. What, what can we do to get more an entrepreneurial spirit so that Singapore can actually realize its full potential? Take some risks, but some of them can be, you know, well insured or well guarded, but it is worthwhile doing this. Your views, Sir Minister. Minister. What, what you mentioned is uh, in some sense very true because once you have some success you start to feel that let's not risk it. Yeah, I'd rather sit on whatever success I have, enjoy life a bit, why risk everything? Uh, and I think you do find that attitude in more mature companies you know, in Singapore. Having said that, I'd like to assure you and assure everyone here that the entrepreneurial spirit in Singapore is actually alive, kicking, and maybe even thriving. Uh, but they are coming from quarters that we have not expected. And today, we, we do graduate employment survey for every of our polytechnic and universities. Today, it's, harder, it's, more, it's very easy to interview someone and the graduates say, I'm not taking a full-time job because I'm preparing with my friends to start a new business. And you find that increasingly uh, as a common response from our graduate students. You look at the incubators now in NUS as well as NTU, and NUS have a very vibrant incubator in Block 71 and the hangar, and you see students, faculty, a very vibrant uh, atmosphere there, everyone starting their own business, everyone wanting to be MNC from day one. Because with digital technology, I go, over, I, I go overseas from day one. I'm aiming my first dollar revenue to be from overseas and not Singapore. And you start to see Singapore companies or Singapore-based companies, whether it's Garena, now they're called C, or Grab, doing well. And they are in 109, Grab for example, it's in almost 200 Indonesian cities, you know. Uh, so all these are new sectors from new quarters, from new source of entrepreneurs that's a bit different from the past. I believe years of investing in R&D in Singapore, progressively and gradually and steadily, it will pay off in terms of new ideas, new knowledge, converted to patents and business models, 
converted to startups and enterprises that can go overseas and tap into a vibrant regional market. So I feel quite positive that the entrepreneurial spirit is alive and kicking, especially amongst our young. And I think we can do a lot more to encourage that. And I think this must be the second wave of growth for Singapore. Thank you, Minister. I think this has been a very good session. Please show your appreciation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister and Ambassador Pillai. Ladies and gentlemen, the Minister will now take his leave.